yeah, good evening. Uh, welcome. Um, the lecture is going to be in English, but my welcome is going to be in German because it's much easier for me to speak in German. Uh, ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich uh, willkommen heißen und ich spreche auch deshalb Deutsch, weil Nancy Deutsch studiert hat und das sehr, sehr gut versteht, obwohl sie so tut, als würde sie es nicht verstehen. Uh, also deshalb auch meine Begrüßung in Deutsch. Ich freue mich ganz besonders, dass Sie heute gekommen sind. Wie Sie wissen, beginnen wir immer das akademische Jahr im Wiener Wiesenthal-Institut einerseits mit einer Simon Wiesenthal-Lecture, andererseits auch wieder mit dem Ereignis, das für uns im akademischen Jahr besonders wichtig ist. Das ist die Sitzung des Internationalen Wissenschaftlichen Beirats, der uns dankenswerterweise immer wieder unterstützt, einen Input gibt. Ich möchte mich auch hier ganz herzlich, einige Vertreter sind ja hier anwesend, äh, vor allem auch äh, Professor Sibylle Steinbacher, die äh, die Vorsitzende äh, dieses Gremiums ist. Also noch einmal vielen Dank für die Mühe, für die Arbeit heute. Wir haben einen anstrengenden Tag hinter uns, glaube ich, weil wir sehr, sehr viel diskutiert haben. Wir haben auch sehr, sehr viel berichtet über unsere Arbeit, aber es freut mich ganz besonders, dass Sie sozusagen alle so zahlreich heute wieder erschienen sind. Ich begrüße besonders unsere Sprecherin für heute, das auch ein Signal sein soll für die Weiterentwicklung des Instituts. Einerseits natürlich ist dieses Schwerpunkt liegt in den Holocaust-Studien, in der Vorgeschichte, in der Nachgeschichte, in der Erforschung des Antisemitismus, auch der Geschichte des Antisemitismus und des Rassismus. Aber einer dieser Schwerpunkte oder einer dieser erweiterten Schwerpunkte wird es sein, dass wir uns auch mit dem Stalinismus, mit dem Gulag auseinandersetzen möchten. Zwei Vertreterinnen im Internet Nationalen Wissenschaftlichen Beirat stehen ja dafür, einerseits Nancy Adler, andererseits Irina Scherbakova von der Memorial äh, in Moskau. Das soll sozusagen dieses Signal sein, dass wir uns in diese Richtung ein bisschen weiterentwickeln werden und auch sozusagen einladen, Fellows äh, das zu beforschen. Nancy Adler wird uns heute unter dem the, the, the Future of the Stalinist Pass und zwar einen Einblick geben in diese, äh, äh, diese Gulag-Forschung. Uh, und ich begrüße Sie ganz besonders herzlich. Sie ist Absolventin eines Colleges, des Barnard Colleges, uh, das ein Teil heute, ein Teil von der Columbia University ist. Dieses College wurde 1889 gegründet, ist in der Morningside Heights, also ein sehr prominenter Teil von New York und wurde deshalb gegründet, weil die Columbia University in diesen Jahren keine Frauen zugelassen hat. Also es ist ein ganz besonderer Aspekt, und ganz interessant, 1889 dass sich die Columbia University noch immer versperrt hat, wurde gegründet, ist heute, glaube ich, ein ganz besonders renommiertes Institut. Die äh, Zulassungsquote, habe ich jetzt gelesen, beträgt bei 12 Prozent, also von den Bewerbern. Also es ist eine gewissermaßen eine wirkliche Elite-Institution. Nancy Adler hat auch dort dissertiert, und zwar mit, einem, mit dem Titel The Great Return, The Gulag Survivor and the Soviet System. Und ich möchte, sie ist jetzt inzwischen die wissenschaftliche die Forschungsleiterin im NIOD, das ist eine, ich sage das jetzt nicht auf Niederländisch, äh, übersetzt heißt das das äh, Holländisch, niederländische Institut für Kriegs-, Genozid- und Holocaustforschung, ist auch ein sehr, sehr ein riesiges Institut, ich kenne es, weil wir äh, verbandelt sind, würde ich einmal sagen, auf Österreichisch mit diesem Institut über ein großes europäisches Unionsprojekt, IRI, European Holocaust Research Infrastructure. Ich hatte also schon die Freude, die Ehre, die Arbeit, äh, dort sozusagen dabei zu sein in dieser Konzeption dieses Projektes in einem altehrwürdigen äh, Amsterdamer Haus in der Herrengracht. Ein wunderschönes Haus, um das ich Sie ein bisschen auch beneide, aber es auch nicht haben möchte, muss ich ehrlich sagen. Also willkommen. Wie gesagt, ich möchte jetzt nicht eingehen auf die zahlreichen Publikationen von Nancy Adler, im Wesentlichen natürlich Gulag-Forschung, im Wesentlichen Oral History, ich glaube methodologisch durch etwas Ähnliches, was wir am Institut mit dem Holocaust machen, aber ich möchte wirklich, wie gesagt, diese zahlreichen äh, Publikationen nicht aufzählen. And now I pass on the floor to you. Welcome to Vienna, and I hope you understood me at least a little bit, and thank you for coming to Vienna. Welcome. Bella, thank you for this generous uh, introduction, which was mercilessly fast for me to understand, but I did pick that up. Um, first of all, I'd like to say it's a great honor for me to be giving the Simon Wiesenthal Lecture, and I am very proud to serve on the International uh, Advisory Board 
among such distinguished colleagues. I have a special connection with Vienna. I sprouted some root here in 1980 when my stepfather came from New York to open up the crime prevention branch of the UN. Uh, I made some very special friends here. They're all right here, the whole Burgenland gang. Uh, and as one said to me, Vienna is part of me. So that makes it extraordinary that I can actually be here today and in this capacity. So moving from Vienna to Russia. Nearly 30 years, an entire generation, after the end of a 70-year dictatorship that claimed millions of victims, aside from symbolic reparations, the post-Soviet governments have implemented little to none of the recognized, institutionalized, transitional justice mechanisms to reckon with this past. It was not until 2015 that the state sanctioned the plan for an official monument to the victims of Stalinism. Most of them did not live to see it erected. But if they did, this would be the message they were given. This plaque marks the entrance to the wall of sorrow. That there were victims is undeniable. Khrushchev opened that door, and Gorbachev made it impossible to shut. But what this sign does not say speaks volumes on Russia's inability, unwillingness, or limitations in confronting the Stalinist past. It is formulated largely agentless, as if catastrophe hit. It does not state that Russia's 20th century leaders did this to their own people. The abstract reference to the victims of political repression in the memorial's name goes back to the official interpretation of Stalin's crimes as set forth in Khrushchev's 1956 speech. He never raised the issue of the state's responsibility for the crimes, which he attributed to Stalin and his henchmen, and he limited it to the political purges of 1937 and 38. Neither forced collectivization nor ethnic deportations made it into his secret speech, which essentially denounced Stalin's cult of personality. Putin's speech at the monument's opening ceremony over 60 years later was even more oblique. Without mentioning by, uh, Stalin by name, <clears throat> he spoke vaguely of the tragedy, terrible past, cruel blow, and dark events that should never be forgotten or justified. In essence, such circumspect references frame these dark events, as I said, as some sort of disaster that hit the country, rather than a deliberate Soviet policy targeting its own population. So here you see Putin standing next to Patriarch Kirill. The Russian, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church has been a good ally for the Kremlin because of their politically safe focus on the martyrs. So now, as under Khrushchev and Gorbachev, the government sanctions or allows the immortalization of victims to a point. But it draws a rather thick line when it comes to the discussion of perpetrators. Not one henchman has been tried, nor one truth commission instigated. Victim compensation is limited, as is archival access. The record in history textbooks is a political narrative, and researchers of Stalinism are still arrest or harassed, arrested or harassed on spurious charges. Putin said here that we should mourn the victims, but not bring the country to renewed confrontation by settling scores. Rather than confronting its history of multiple regime abuses, there's been a persistent, politically driven effort to manage national and public memory by repressing, controlling, or even co-opting the memory of repression as suggested by the sign, which largely credits Putin and his government for their efforts. Such, reconceptual such reconceptualization of the past has served as a short-term remedy to circumvent any obligation for Russia to undertake transitional justice. This development was not really anticipated. At the end of the Soviet era, it seemed inevitable that the nation's history of repression would be more fully acknowledged and redressed. So almost 15 years ago, 
I published this article. And it outlined these coexisting trends and the struggle in Russia of forgetting against memory to subvert Milan Kunderov's observation regarding man and political power. So at that time, I concluded that it was perhaps too early or too late to confront the Stalinist past. What I did not anticipate was the stubborn continuity of this trend. Indeed, a more apt title would have been the future of the Soviet past remains predictable. Allow me to take you to 10 years before that and revisit one additional moment of my past observations before I turn to more current issues. 20 some years ago, several of my Gulag returnee interviewees, many aged 90 at the time, concluded that it would take a generation for real changes to occur in the mentality and long political tradition that suppressed the dignity of the individual. Their hope was with the first graders of 1996 who are now in their late 20s. They thought that they would be fully able to confront the Stalinist past. I was equally convinced of this. We were wrong. A walk down the sidewalks of Berlin or Moscow reveals a palpable contrast between the German and Russian approaches to their repressive history. Among its many commemorative symbols, Berlin sidewalks solemnly display well over 5,000 Stolpersteine, marking the homes where the victims of Nazism once lived. I hardly have to tell that to this crowd. I've seen, I've seen many on the streets of Vienna. Over 70,000 such stones have been placed in other European cities. This one I found in Freiburg. Post-Nazi Germany's full acknowledgement of its repressive history, impelled by defeat, permitted it to progress toward a democratic political system. By contrast, post-Soviet Russia had no similar challenge to its repression of individual rights. And consequently, efforts to bring the Stalinist terror into the public space have been sparse and are often marginalized. In fact, 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the achievements of the Stalinist system and Stalin himself are still, or again, being acknowledged and even valorized. However, despite the politically expedient trend of imposing a national amnesia of the Gulag, efforts have been made to investigate historical injustices and publicize a counter-history to the state-sponsored narratives. I'll address these efforts tonight, and I'll explain why they have had difficulty finding resonance. I think this will connect closely with some of the important research questions the Simon Wiesenthal Institute is pursuing. The success of, for lack of a better term, transitional justice in post-Soviet Russia may depend on its ability to forge a dialogue between official and personal narratives and create an inclusive history of the state's repression of its own people based on credible evidence and validated by a credible audience. So in the rest of this talk tonight, I will, uh, I will talk about these topics and I will also reflect on how to move beyond current impasses. So let's start by looking at some small but significant countercurrents that have been provided by the anti-Stalinist organization Memorial and other NGOs who have subverted official attempts to ignore or co-opt the history of repression. Irina Sherbakova is in the audience tonight. She's a fellow member of the advisory board. Uh, I've known her for 30 years, and she is a very important driving force in the organization Memorial. In 2014, civil society orchestrated a campaign entitled Last Address, offering individuals the chance to place a name plaque on the buildings from which their relatives were removed, often never to return. So this one states, here lived Vladimir Abramovich Nikolaev, pediatrician, <coughs> born 1902, arrested 1936, executed on the 19th of December, 1938, and rehabilitated in 1961. And you see to the left of the text, a starkly empty square has been cut in the metal, representing the void the repression created in the lives of millions of Soviet citizens, 
arrested without warning and executed or incarcerated. And it also represents the void created by the official avoidance of what actually happened. Despite the tens of thousands of Moscovites, there are no more than some dozens or hundreds of plaques in Moscow. And each plaque represents a renewed struggle with the authorities, this time just for permission to hang them. Now, I've heard from Irina that the practice is getting a little bit more spread, which is a hopeful sign. Such controlling of national and public memory is a phenomenon that is clearly not unique to Russia. It characterizes numerous post but still repressive societies that have been unable, unwilling, or resistant to embrace transitional justice mechanisms and the global ascent of human rights discourses. So actually, this non-case study illuminates some of the more pressing challenges facing our field today. So turning to which past to remember, among the difficulties of constructing the history of Soviet repression is grasping the intricacy of a process that moved so casually from non-existent evidence to lethal consequences. Sorry, this was a slide from before. It's, um, it, it is this, uh, uh, these plaques, it says, one name, one life, one sign. So, I won't read this to you, but this was excerpt excerpted from NKVD execution lists. Every year, at the end of October, on the eve of the Day of Political Prisoners, Memorial organizes a name-reading ceremony to publicly read the names of tens of thousands. Um, these were apolitical undesirables shot in the back of the neck on the day of sentencing and dumped in a mass grave on the outskirts of Moscow. These were the lists. Memorial has published them. This is the name of the action, the return of names. I've attended a few times. This is me uh, uh, reading from the piece of paper given to me in 2011. Each year, the organization struggles for permission to publicly remember these few thousand of the millions of victims. And each year, they encounter new or renewed obstacles. This year, I was listening to the live feed, and a woman had uh, read the names of her family, and she said, we will not forget, we will not forgive. The commemoration gathering takes place at the Monument to the Victims of Totalitarianism. It's a stone from the Solovetsky Islands, the first labor camp under Lenin. It was erected by Memorial in 1990, right across from the notorious <clears throat> Lubyanka, which we see in the background. Until 2015, there was not one state-sponsored commemorative plaque in Moscow to victims of Stalinism. Now there's a well-funded Moscow City-sponsored Gulag Museum. In its permanent display and public programs, the museum focuses not on how many millions Stalin killed, but rather on the individual fates of the victims. Although its depiction of gross human rights violations within the Gulag is accurate, it avoids mentioning that the system of repression beyond the Gulag was the modus operandi of Soviet rule nor does its critical appraisal extend to present human rights violations. As I mentioned, revision of the past has been the short-term remedy to circumvent the obligation to undertake transitional justice in post-Soviet Russia. The fashioning of a good future out of a bad past has been facilitated by the construction of a usable past for the national narrative. And this narrative is reinforced by a present patriotism that calls for Western franchises like McDonald's to be replaced by Yidim Doma, let's eat at home. Um, in museum exhibitions like this one, you can see I'm not always such a skilled photographer. This is at the Museum of the Revolution. The banner on the right says, Crimea, the history of its return. We can also see it in publications like Words That Changed the World, a 2015 volume of Putin's Collected Wisdom, edited by a youth group. <laughs> and it is reflected in films, school curricula, and legislation. And I'll get back to those. Included in this form of patriotism is the casual acceptance of repression, which has been successfully coupled 
with the valorization of Stalin and his role in the Second World War. Many of these gen uh, trends are generated from the top down, but they have found broad public resonance and are also reinforced from the bottom up with the support of the Orthodox Church and the emergent cult surrounding the Soviet and Stalin's victory in the Great Patriotic War. While there are countercurrents from parts of civil society, as I've explained, they have met considerable resistance. In the absence of judicial reckoning, a truth commission, or a host of other institutionalized approaches to confront a repressive past, the current regime appears to be trudging forward with no coherent vision or even particular impetus to move past its Soviet past. A Soviet-era adage proclaimed that Lenin is always with us, and it alluded to the omnipresence of the leader of the Bolshevik Revolution in public and private spaces. Lenin, though still physically with us as he lays embalmed in a museum, uh, in a mausoleum on Red Square, has now been relegated to the communist past. Stalin has not. In fact, nearly 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the history of the crimes of Stalin and Stalinism have been so successfully glossed over that nationwide polls show his popularity edging back towards pre-de-Stalinization levels and gaining momentum. It is certain that Stalin is always with us. According to a 2015 poll, 38% of the respondents agreed that the Soviet people's sacrifices during the Stalin era were justified by the results that were achieved in such a short period. And this is just one of the many polls. Apparently, the industrialization and the wartime victory were more relevant to those polled than the millions of victims that can be traced back, in part, to those very same accomplishments. In 2016, 40% of the respondents believed that Stalin should not be considered a state criminal, and they appraised the Stalin, the Stalin era as being more good than bad. Sorry, I have to do my water dance over here. Finally, in 2017, 46% of those polled viewed Stalin with respect and even enthusiasm. Stalin's burgeoning popularity reflects the longing to restore the country's former prestige and the security of a more strictly, if forcibly, regulated society. And it's a trend followed but also led by the present regime. So what appeared as an aberration around the celebration of the 60th anniversary of the victory of the Second World War in 2005, and that's when I wrote that article, had become nearly the norm 10 years later. At that time, a portrait on, of Stalin on a trolleybus in St. Petersburg caused a furor. By 2015, his image is emblazoned on private cars, advertising boards, and posters, and it no longer provokes outrage. So what we see is that alongside official measures that purport to criminalize pro-Stalin propaganda, the parallel process of rehabilitation of Stalin continues on buses, in monuments, in stores, in textbooks, and in the public space. In 2016, the Communist Party seized the opportunity to, as it were, capitalize on this trend and the longing for order by declaring that to be the year of Stalin and the Stalin Spring. This marked the 80th anniversary of the 1936 Stalin Constitution, proclaiming the primacy of the Communist Party, and several local parties developed initiatives to better educate the populace on Stalin. Such select remembrance led one liberal politician to cynically comment, quote, when they talk about the Stalin era, they imagine the holster at the side, but not the barrel to the back of their neck. Civil society leaders today are appalled by the fact that post-Soviet identity has become so closely associated with aggressiveness and despotism. Had Stalin and Stalinism been formally judged after the collapse of the Soviet Union, any glorification or commercialization would have been proscribed or tabooed. Such an opportunity might have presented itself 
at the 1992 trial to determine the constitutionality of the ban on the Communist Party. In a 1998 interview I did with Sergei Kavalyov, former dissident and human rights commissioner under Yeltsin, he suggested that this hearing could have been a Russian Nuremberg on the crimes of communism. It never ended up getting beyond the issue at hand and decidedly did not address Stalin's crimes head on. Consequently, nearly 30 years later, Stalin, his era and symbols, not illegal nor taboo, have been gradually appropriated by mass culture. Stalin is increasingly seeped into the public space. Matryoshka dolls with the image of Stalin are a permanent feature of tourist bazaars. One can dine in restaurants named after Stalin. Higher security services from Czechist, this was the name of uh, Lenin's secret service workers, get pipelines repaired by Stalinism in Sochi and pay a company called Beria in Volgograd to carry out soil works. Stalin's rise in popularity was accompanied by a sequence of more official mem- uh, measures, including the 2009 restoration of an ode to Stalin engraved in a prominent Moscow metro station, and the creation of a state commission to guard against the falsification of history to the detriment of Russia's interests. These measures prompted human rights organizations to presciently argue in 2009 that, quote, de-Stalinization is Russia's acutest problem at the moment. The identification of a human rights issue as Russia's problem is true, but the state asserts a competing truth and prioritizes a different problem. As a human rights issue, the politically expedient imposition of a national amnesia regarding the Gulag undermines the integrity of the collective memory, further marginalizes and victimizes the dwindling generation uh, generation of Gulag survivors, and is an impediment to transitional justice. By contrast, the issue prioritized by Russia's past and present rulers was not confronting this criminal history, but rather strengthening the stability and legitimacy of the regime. They were concerned about a de-Stalinization that might emerge uncontrollably from below. It's a fear that's constant, and it's probably correct. The revelations regarding state-sponsored repression may not have been a major determinant in facilitating the collapse of the Soviet Union, but their importance might be assessed by the importance placed on censoring them. So accordingly, rather than following the European example of recognizing the victims and crimes of Nazism through commemoration, Stolpersteine, transforming campsites into memorial museums, and substantive compensation. The only museum on a former gulag site at Perm was co-opted by the authorities to misrepresent the gulag as a bulwark against fifth column subversive seeking to undermine the Soviet people. And I'll get back to Perm in a minute. Nuremberg was not a voluntary exercise and it has been much criticized as victor's justice. But it set an institutional precedent for acknowledging grave violations of human rights committed by individuals and a state system. And despite its shortcomings in the wake of a defeated apartheid regime, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission sought and forged a dialogue between official and personal narratives and formulated an inclusive history. By contrast, decades After the collapse of communism, as I noted, we have no such history of the Soviet state's repression of its own people. And so Russia's current official approach to the memory of Stalinism can most accurately be characterized if we subvert Santayana's oft-quoted admonition and if we say, those who do not want to be condemned by the past should remember their history to provide a positive spin. So turning to remembrance, the subjects of who, what, and how to remember are particularly complicated questions in post-repressive states who believe their survival depends on the careful monitoring of selected omissions. The history of the state's mass murder 
and terrorization of its own citizens runs counter to the mythologized Soviet victory over the barbaric Nazi regime. And that's a cornerstone of the state-generated narrative. Indeed, the director of the State Archive of the Russian Federation was demoted in 2016 for publishing this document, deflating the myth of the heroic defense of Moscow. In the narrative promoted, uh, promoted by the state, the war is cleansed of numerous gray zones, and it's reframed into a story of exceptional heroism displayed by the Soviet people. An acknowledgment of culpability in Soviet mass crimes undermines much that was foundational to some citizens today, such as industrialization, the eradication of illiteracy, and other achievements of the Stalinist era. Just this past August, on the 80th anniversary of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact that divided Europe into spheres of influence, the Russian government spun a narrative uh, that praised this move as a feat of Soviet diplomacy. Uh, they said, quote, the only strategically possible step, a forced and difficult decision that allowed the Soviet Union to prepare for the imminent future war. For at least the last 10, if not 25 years, human rights organizations have called for the government to acknowledge the crimes of Stalinism, present apologies, and launch a federal program dedicated to remembering their oppression. Their recommendations included a call for the state to admit its culpability and to acknowledge that the whole country was one big katin. But they, but they emphasized restorative justice and commemoration. Some actual steps have been made, but genuine official support for a program to eliminate the vestiges of Stalinism has been inconsistent and long in coming. For example, Medvedev was in favor of the idea of creating a database of victims, but he stopped short of supporting the request for a, quote, political legal judgment of the crimes of the communist regime. He questioned what authority what authority could condemn the former regime, and he rejected the very idea that the state could admit culpability on behalf of the state. He argued that, quote, legal judgments are passed by judges, not even the president or parliament. Notwithstanding all of its ambiguity, if not ambivalence, regarding the Stalinist past, in 2015, the Russian government endorsed a bill on the remembrance of victims of political repression. It addressed memorialization, books of remembrance, databases, archival access, and victim recognition and compensation. It allowed the monument to be placed in central Moscow, and the city of Moscow allocated a building and funds for the construction of the Gulag Museum I mentioned earlier. Along with these measures, the state supported a parallel practical patriotism though it didn't define precisely what that was. State support for a de-Stalinization program runs counter to the militant patriotism it also endorses. So civil society is chronically tasked to monitor the Russian government's words and deeds. Today, the work of historians and civil society actors who challenge the official narrative of the present or past events has become more marginalized and, in some cases, even dangerous. Memorial has been accused of political activities and targeted for official harassment for not having declared themselves foreign agents in keeping with a 2012 law. This is Memorial headquarters in 2013. It says foreign agent loves USA. In 2015, the label of foreign agent was slapped on the St. Petersburg branch of Memorial for being a recipient of foreign funds. And the following year, the Ministry of Justice confiscated 32,000 pages of documents from Memorial's Moscow headquarters. The organization has been accused of, quote, undermining Russia's constitutional foundations and even of attempting to overthrow the government. They share this politically precarious status with a number of other NGOs. 
it appears that such state-sponsored measures could severely limit the functioning of this human rights watchdog, which emerged during Gorbachev's perestroika. And that's a fact that I'll get back to in just a minute. In the last few years, the organization has been increasingly threatened with liquidation. This wouldn't be that hard. As the late chairman said, quote, they could also just kill us with fines. A siege mentality on the part of the government, accompanied by such attempts to suppress civil society, harks back to Soviet propaganda images of capitalist encirclement with internal ed enemies aided and abetted by foreign enemies. In an interview I did a few years ago with Chairman Arseniy Raginsky, whose passing in December of 2017 was a tremendous loss to the human rights community, he reflected on the predicament of the organization. He no longer characterized the state's obstacles to, the work as, to their work as battles. He termed them a chronic condition. He was prescient, not just about memorial, but about the grim condition of intellectual and academic freedom in general. Earlier this year, the Ministry of Education sent a protocol recommendation to scholarly institutions with regard to controlling their contact with visiting foreigners. The last time I witnessed this phenomenon was in my student days in the 1980s. So turning to the destruction of the museum at Labor Camp Perm, here's another of my wrong past predictions. In 2002, I wrote in my book, The Gulag Survivor, quote, post-war Europe made the concentration camps an important theme in its efforts to expose the ideology and practices of fascism. Post-Soviet Russia has the potential to do the same. The beginnings are evident. And then I went on to identify and describe the efforts to transform the labor camp perm that Gorbachev closed in 1987 into a museum. It was dedicated in 1995 and in subsequent years substantially developed. Observers and participants in those years did not foresee that the government would view it as a threat that had to be eliminated. In 2014, as the power and water were shut off by the authorities and the camp's watchtower bulldozed, it was evident that Perm's physical survival was in peril. The survival of its factual history was also imperiled by a state-run television report featuring interviews with former guards who claimed that only traitors were incarcerated in Perm. Irina Sherbakova showed us a wonderful documentary on Perm uh, last year. Perm had become another battleground for contesting the history of the repression. Turning to national memory and the national narrative or state-generated history, the memory of the Gulag has not yet found an accommodating place in the national memory. While the current Russian administration cannot get the historical genie back into the political bottle, they have attempted to constrain its effects. Many Soviet leaders were concerned about desalinization and they, and they imposed limitations accordingly. So during dissertation research in the 1990s, I gained access to this document of Politburo proceedings from November 19, uh, 1988, in which the agenda item memorial was up for discussion. Gorbachev was apprehensive about the political potential of the organization. And here in the corner, he opted for retaining the investigation of the Soviet past in the hands of the party by limiting memorial to the regional level under party supervision. He feared its mandate. Apparently, an accurate account of the victimizations under seven decades of Soviet rule could not be included in a Soviet history that Russians would be proud of, unless this disclosure was coupled with pride in the government's pledge to deal with the damage wrought by Stalin. The expedient solution they arrived at was to construct a purposefully incomplete history that marginalized the repression and the gulag. So this strategy permits the current government to condemn the Soviet terror and control history at the same time by co-opting some of the tasks of civil society. Creeping Stalinization, as it has been increasingly termed, casts a long shadow over Russia. 
This phenomenon has taken on all kinds of forms, as is in the case of the British uh, French feature film, The Death of Stalin, which some of you may have seen. Two days before its scheduled release in Russia in January of 2018, the Ministry of Culture suspended its license. What made it problematic in the eyes of Russian bureaucrats was not its subject, but its genre. It was a comedy. Had it not been for such a strong reaction, the film might have gone largely unnoticed. It was a B-movie of limited artistic and historical value. The reason given by top Russian officials as to the decision to ban the film made even seasoned observers raise their eyebrows. Radio Liberty ran the headline, Stalin's death canceled. <laughs> a group of lawyers employed by the Ministry of Culture petitioned to postpone the release until summer of, 19, uh, of 2018. The lawyers thought the movie was extremist. They said it aroused hatred and hostility uh, to humiliate the dignity of the Russian and Soviet people. Uh, and they thought that the film's creators were trying to, quote, falsify our country's past so that the life of the Soviet people during the 1950s would only invoke dread and aversion. But what they essentially objected to was the uh, unflattering portrayal of Stalin's bumbling entourage engaged in a life-saving uh, operation uh, in the wake of their boss's death. The Communist Party wanted the film banned as a, quote, instrument of the information war raged, uh, waged against Russia. So turning to curricula. The reforms government imposes on curricula are clear indicators of what it wants students to learn about and from the past. And I should say that though educational materials are fashioned to reflect the views of the government, in practice, teachers still feel more or less free to disregard the content of the official textbooks. The approved account of history taught in Russian high schools today is a sanitized version of the Stalinist past. Putin, who famously described the collapse of the Soviet Union as, quote, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century uh, in 2005, has been an influential advocate of this narrative. He later argued that Russia should not be made to feel guilty about the Great Purge of 1937 because in other countries, even worse things happened. Putin admitted to certain problematic pages in Russia's history, but he said in the same breath, what country could possibly claim not having had these? So this stance is both cause and effect of Russia having made no substantial effects to come to terms with the legacy of Soviet communism. On the one hand, prominent Russians, such as Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Andrei Sakharov, compelled the state to publicly disavow repression. But on the other, the country's leadership and many of its citizenry have become dependent on repression to maintain stability. In 2008, in an effort to promote patriotism among younger people, a teacher's manual covering the period 1900 to 1945 was officially approved for use in schools. Now achieving such a goal for these years through the use of history required considerable manipulation of facts as well as contriving creative interpretations. So teachers were instructed to focus on, quote, what we built in the 1930s. Uh, and Stalin acted in a concrete historical situation. As leader, he acted entirely rationally as the guardian of the system. Now, since the scope of the repression does not readily fit into the concept of rational governments, the manual suggests working the numbers a bit. The fact that some youth organizations today proudly proclaim, quote, we leapt forward, we created a country of tanks from a country of plows, attests to the effectiveness of this history lesson. In 2014, the Putin administration initiated the creation of a textbook whose narrative would present a unitary vision emphasizing the role of Stalin as effective manager. He didn't want dual interpretation, and the central message was to be, we are citizens of a great country with a great past. Now, as far as I know, this textbook initiative did not come to fruition. Around this time, the Moscow Russian History Teachers Association circulated a list of no less than 31 controversial subjects from the 17th century onward. Regarding Stalin, attention was to be directed to the role of his personality 
with no reference to the Stalinist repressions. Uh, teachers' guidelines suggested to interpret the behavior within the framework of a, quote, one-party system dictatorship and the autocracy of Stalin. So in other words, one-party rule endowed this autocrat, uh, autocrat with excess, excess power. Whereas Khrushchev blamed Stalin to save the party, this approach seems to be doing the opposite. So the Soviet past maintains a stronghold, if not a stranglehold, on Russia. So despite the introduction of Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago into the high school curriculum, which, is, which was an initiative supported, if not driven, by Putin, a subtext of this history lesson is that the political ethos is perhaps, perhaps not fully ready to change. State-sponsored efforts aside, some studies have found that the value system and ingrained uh, attitudes of many teachers and local school administrations remain largely preserved despite the collapse of the Soviet Union. Teachers who were interviewed revealed that they did not even bother reading the programmatic documents with which they were bombarded. Rather, they drew instead directly from their professional experience of the late of the 1980s USSR. Now, if this is the case, there was a great disconnect with the expectations of gulag survivors who emerged as relatively prominent voices in those same years. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, many a returnee who gave testimony pinned their hopes, as I said in the beginning, on the first graders uh, who at that time were born in an already independent Russia. They believed it would take a generation for real changes to occur in both the mentality and long political tradition that suppressed the dignity of the individual. But in reality, in the course of one generation, the opposite seems to have occurred. So turning to remembering or reconstructing the past. Since Stalin's death, the view of the Stalinist past has been adjusted to fit the state's needs. Organizations such as Memorial view the efforts to hide the scope and consequences of the repression as an unhealthy, lost opportunity to learn from mistakes of the past. Its efforts to bring the full history of Stalinism into the arena of public discourse are regularly discouraged and occasionally co-opted. Allow me to, to cite two important friends and mentors, uh, Gulag returnees from two different generations who passed away in the last few years. Simeon Vilensky, whose passing in 2006 marked the end of an era, was incensed by the fact that there had never been a moral condemnation of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. He, was the, he spoke with the authority as the head of a different victim's organization, Vazvrashenia, the return. He was a Kalima survivor, a memoir publisher, and the only member of the Rehabilitation Commission who had been a Stalin-era prisoner. He thought that Russia would benefit from a Nuremberg trial without blood. He wanted uh, those who, who were found guilty of crimes against humanity to receive the maximum penalty and then be pardoned. Vilensky, who died at the age of 88, was one of the last remaining survivors of the Stalinist era. Until the end of his life, he called for the state to recognize and repent. Arseny Raginsky's passing in 2017 signaled the end of a different era. Arseny Raginsky, memorial chair and founder, an ex-prisoner of the dissident era and fellow member of the Rehabilitation Commission, argued that identifying victims is only the first step in dealing with the repression. He said, quote, the memory of Stalinism in Russia is almost always the memory of victims. Victims, not crimes. Unlike the Nazis, we mainly killed our own people, and our consciousness refused to accept this fact. According to Roginsky, identifying the oppressors, many still unnamed, would be the next step in remediating the past and improving the future. And Memorial is actually actively engaged in this process. This is a publication by Nikita Petrov, uh, 
vice president of Memorial's Scientific uh, Information Center. Um, it's on the Katyn executioners. It's called Rewarded for Execution. And their faces are here, so their names and faces are published. According to a Soviet aphorism, it was easy to talk about the present and future, but the past keeps changing every day. Stalinism and its victims occupy a lacuna in the nation's image of itself. But the vanishing community of Gulag returnees and their survivors remain determined to remember, to record, and to publicize the crimes committed in the name of Soviet communism. Their efforts have been met with strong official resistance because Russia has invested heavily in the creation of a pur purposively incomplete official history. So in the Soviet era, there was a fairly consistent recognition that a fuller history of the repression could undermine the legitimacy of the regime. And in the post-Soviet era, the past has been promoted as a rallying point for patriotism and national pride. So nearly three decades after the end of the Soviet Union, Russia has crafted an approach to its Stalinist history that would burnish its national image. Its citizens are largely encouraged not to focus on the crimes that had taken place under the Soviet regime, but rather to look to the bright past of national achievements. So what can be concluded from all of this? While integrating the story of the terror into the mainstream history of Russia is a relatively straightforward task at the level of historical scholarship, it has been frustrated by political obstacles. Overcoming them would require a fundamental shift from a system of governance that devalues human rights toward a democratic ethos that prioritizes them, which would include undertaking transitional justice measures. However, the Russian government's efforts to focus attention on the material and military benefits under Stalin and de-emphasize Stalin's crimes suggest that promoting this skewed version of history is the best mechanism available for sustaining repressive governance. In consequence, organizations pursuing an accurate history of the Stalinist past are at risk for being charged with engaging in undesired political activity and even of attempting to overthrow the Russian government. Post-Soviet Russia is attempting to relegate Stalin's repression to the past without recognizing its influence on the present. While the current regime may recognize the national and international resistance to repression, and even the socio-cultural evolution I have termed the age of transitional justice, they fear that the only alternative might be the chaos that followed the dissolution of the Soviet Union. This approach has narrowed the field to two major narratives of the repression. The stories of the victims and survivors still seeking recognition and compensation from the government, even as the last Gulag survivors die out. And the official redacted history aimed to both sanitize Stalin's repression and persuade the public that the survival of the state required the suppression of individual rights and still does. This is a calendar from 2017. This latter message has gained the competitive edge even so, perhaps it is not too late for accountability for Stalinist crimes, even if Gulag survivors are no longer around to witness it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this inspiring talk. Uh, and as it has become customs, now you have the chance to discuss some of the thesis of Nancy. It was a lot of listening. Hmm? No, there's some <laughs> other question. Um, there, is, there has been a certain criticism of transitional justice argumentation recently from a post-colonial perspective, arguing that traditional justice as embodied by the ITJ or other bodies and, 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 and the way it formulated this hypothesis since 
roughly 2000, and your own publications, of course, come from or, or date back to that time, um, that they have been, at least in the global south, an instrument of neoliberal reform and anti-colonial, um, or, or like a neo-colonial imperialist stance. So I was wondering if within Russia, um, anybody has picked up on that argument. If, of course, Russia is not part of the global south, so it would be it wouldn't really work. But I was wondering if there is any kind of, of um, association with this anti-transitional justice argument mm. within Russia. Thank you. A very good question, a uh, very well-informed question. Uh, yeah, there is, even um, in the decolonization question, that has been swept into what I think is the age of transitional justice. That is, the general uh, acceptance of the idea that successor states are uh, responsible for confronting the crimes of predecessor regime. In Russia, uh, it's a non-case of transitional justice. It is, it is not something that uh, uh, has uh, at all really gotten into the discourse. Memorial has tried to raise many of the issues. Uh, uh, the words tribunal have been raised. Uh, truth commissions uh, were also raised in the, let's say, in, in, in the 90s. None of that is being talked about. Uh, I mean, that's not to say that there, there wouldn't be several, several possibilities uh, that have nothing to do with trials that, 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 might, that might be a way of constructively moving forward. But there's absolutely no impetus to, to, to do any of that. So there hasn't needed to be any criticism of transitional justice because it's just it's kind of a moot, a moot point in that, in that sense. Um, but uh, there are certainly a number of people, at least, at least who take part in any efforts to preserve the memory of Stalinism, who regularly call for something like a moral tribunal or, or uh, uh, use some of the language of transitional justice. And I do want to say, in, in my own perception of transitional justice, it's, it's uh, anything but all of the, all of the legal and, and Western Western models for looking at it because there there is no uh, there is no one size uh, fits all for transitional justice and uh, the West certainly should not uh, uh, should stop claiming any kind of exceptionalism in, in in terms of not confronting their own past and finally there that that is ending the Western exceptionalism but for Russia it just doesn't even play a role right now. Hmm. Uh, wenn Bella schon Deutsch gesprochen hat, kann ich auch Deutsch reden. Du wirst es verstehen, oder ich kann das äh, dann Russisch <lacht> ins Russische übersetzen. Nein, ich wollte mich erstens bei Nancy bedanken für den schönen Vortrag und dass sie unsere Arbeit von Memorial so hochgeschätzt hat, also die natürlich ähm, nur sehr wenig äh, machen konnte. Wir haben niemals gesiegt sozusagen, aber vielleicht ohne uns fehlte, wurde etwas in, in, in Russland fehlen. Aber ähm, äh, nochmals vielen Dank äh, dafür. Und äh, es ist für uns wichtig, dass ähm, es äh, solche, äh, würde ich sagen, auch Forscher und Historiker wie Nancy gibt, die uns seit 30 Jahren begleiten, weil äh, das ist ähm, momentan für uns all die Jahre und momentan ganz besonders wichtig. Ähm, ich wollte vielleicht noch <lacht> ich werde vielleicht noch ein paar Sätze sagen äh, zu äh, dieser sehr würde ich sagen, komplizierter Geschichte. Ähm, äh, einerseits eine gute, Na eine schlechte Nachricht und einerseits vielleicht eine etwas optimistische, nicht in Bezug auf Russland und Russlands Politik, aber in Bezug auf Vergangenheitsbild und Stalins Bild. Ähm, einerseits, äh, um, um es zu verstehen, warum Stalin zu so einem Symbol geworden äh, ist, das, das hat Nancy sehr richtig alles beschrieben. Aber äh, es ist, das muss man ja verstehen, es ist ein Symbol sowohl für die Linken als auch für die Rechten. Das ist sehr interessant, weil also für die Linken 
Oft ist das, also oder für die heutige kommunistische Partei, die eine völlig stalinistische ist, ist das ein Symbol für soziale Gerechtigkeit. Er hatte doch gar nichts, hatte immer nur in den äh, abgerissenen Stiefeln äh, gegangen, hatte überhaupt keine, war äh, natürlich kein Oligarch, hatte überhaupt kein Geld und so. Also, und das ist sozusagen dieses, mh, dieser, My dieser Mythos über den, also dass man mit Stalin, also diese angebliche soziale Gerechtigkeit verbindet, also funktioniert nach wie vor. Und der würde jetzt alle Oligarchen natürlich ins Gefängnis bringen und alle sie und äh, überhaupt nicht Oligarchen, sondern Korruption besiegen. Ja. Und für die Rechtsradikalen ist das ein Symbol, also wie Nancy das richtig beschrieben hat, eines starken Staates das stärkste Symbol des starken Staates, das in der russischen Geschichte gibt und ähm, in vielerlei Hinsicht, in seinem Chauvinismus, in seinem russischen Nationalismus in der Nachkriegszeit und natürlich, also spielt ja, ähm, wie nennt sie richtig gesagt, der große Fall der ähm, Zweite Weltkrieg oder der große Vaterländische Krieg dabei natürlich eine entscheidende Rolle, weil das ist das einzige Ereignis, woraus man stolz sein kann in diesem 20. Jahrhundert. Und etwas noch, man hatte, wir haben niemals äh, aus diesem neuen Russland ist in Wirklichkeit kein starker, entwickelter, also fortgeschrittener in der Technologie und so Staat geworden. Und da sind Ressentiments natürlich bei den Menschen. Das verstehen sie durchaus. Und wenn wir nicht gesiegt haben, sollen die wenigstens um uns die Feinde Angst haben. Wir sind nach wie vor das größte Land und Atomkraft. Und Stalin verkörpert ja diese Angst. Angst, Russland ist eine Festung, überall Feinde und die sollen Angst von uns haben. Also das ist sozusagen ganz grob geschnitten, aber das ist ja das Problem, warum das zu einem Symbol wird. Und das ist eine schlechte Nachricht natürlich, abgesehen von allen schlechten Nachrichten, die aus, aus Russland jeden Tag buchstäblich kommen. Aber es gibt auch eine optimistische Botschaft, würde ich sagen, und Nachricht. Äh, wir spüren in Memorial natürlich einen unglaublichen Druck und ich glaube, man will uns wirklich ja zerstören. Ähm, äh, aber einerseits. Andererseits haben wir solche Unterstützung aus der Gesellschaft, die wir nie in den 90er Jahren gehabt haben. Wir haben junge Menschen um uns herum. Die Menschen stehen drei Stunden lang äh, in der Kälte, um diese Namen vorzulesen. Es kommen Tausende, das hatten wir niemals in den 90er Jahren gehabt. Und, ähm, und ich glaube, also da verläuft ja auch, würde ich sagen, diese Grenze zwischen dem neuen fortgeschrittenen Russland und auch einer neuen Generation, die sich meldet und die meldet sich. Äh, und äh, dieser, würde ich sagen, ähm, aggressiven Macht, also mit wirklich Elementen der Diktatur und, und sogar der sowjetischen, stalinischen Diktatur. Und dieser, also dieser sozusagen modernen Teil der Gesellschaft, die sehr viel, die eigentlich auch bestrebt ist, über die Vergangenheit, das Wissen über die Vergangenheit äh, zu, mh, mehr Wissen über die Vergangenheit und über eigene Familienvergangenheit zu bekommen. Und wir haben so viele Freiwillige dass wir sie überhaupt nicht, nicht, nicht beschäftigen können. Das ist ja, das ist ja äh, fast unvorstellbar. Auch die Schüler kommen zu uns, um einfach unsere Archive zu scannen. Also das ist, um irgendetwas zu tun, äh, sozusagen auch um ein Zeichen zu setzen. Also das ist natürlich im in diesem riesigen Land vielleicht also sozusagen nicht so viel, was an, an der Menge, was, was die Menge anbetrifft. Aber das ist also in meinen Augen ist das ein deutlicher Trend. Und eigentlich die Umfragen zeigen das. Die Umfragen zeigen das, dass auch dieses Bild bei bestimmten also Schichten und Generationen, also das so hochgesprungen ist, also in den 
mh, Nulljahren und so, also sozusagen sinkt. Also, und das ist im gewissen Sinne die Hoffnung. Danke. Just adding something, a question, because exactly that's what I wanted to ask, because while you delivered your lecture, I added 30 to 1945, and this is 1975, which means and, um, I can remember when uh, the miniseries Holocaust in Austria was broadcast uh, on Austrian television. This was also kind of the turning point. Uh, and our, as a history student, we had then to go in the studios and we had to pick up the phones and collect the reactions uh, on, on Holocaust. And it was, for us as history students, it was very uh, shocking what people said. And I can, so, so isn't it that it takes time? I mean, I know that the comparison is um, not justified because so many different agents are involved in that. It's a state and it's different. But if you look, um, isn't it the same in, in Germany? Uh, after 30 years, I mean, it's the point, it's 75, let's look at it as, as have, uh, being 75. And the other question would be, I mean, besides Germany, what country really came to terms with its autocratic, dictatorial past? While you delivered your lecture, I sometimes kind of try to put, instead of Stalin, Horty, instead of, uh, of, the, of the whatever, if, I mean, it's a very cheap comparison now with Hungary, but it's very similar, but it's also, like Spain, it came to my mind, Spain decided not to talk about its past, and nevertheless, it kind of comes up, but it takes the time. I mean, it, in, the Moncloa Pact was in 75, I think, and they said, we are not talking about the past, and suddenly, I don't know, 40 years later, it's, it's here in, in the whole discussion. So, so is it not a riddle? I mean, I can understand there are very different agents involved in that, and the state is very strong in this case, but... but um, shouldn't be a, little, a, bit, a little bit more kind of uh, um, um, understandable what's happening in Russia uh, in, with this past? Very uh, provocative. Yeah, provocative, a very good question, and one that I mean, a lot of work is being done on time and transitional justice. I mean, as I said in the beginning, was it too early after the fall, or was it too late? Well, it's never too late, because we're still talking about perhaps how to deal with uh, the Armenian genocide, and that's after 100 years. So um, with Germany, there was a defeat, and there was Nuremberg. So there were some very important steps being made, and indeed, it took it, an entire generation, and it also took that miniseries, which I remember myself uh, in my American living room, watching that every night, so the awareness. Um, the problem is that there was nothing really done uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union to, to move forward besides Memorial, which has increasingly... I, I mean, I'm, I'm very glad with uh, this, some of the optimistic things that Irina told us, but Memorial right now is not a very optimistic story. And you saw, uh, even at the time, Gorbachev, uh, he worried about the, the um, power that such an organization that is dealing with the history of Stalinism could yield, and, and so the same thing has happened again with that today. You mentioned Spain. There was a long, long silence about the past, but eventually that didn't work. So one of the things that we've discovered is that being silent about the past and not confronting it isn't going to work, because it will eventually have to be, have to be uh, looked at. Some new generation will say that. But the thing is, in the 25, 30 years, this first generation has turned around and gone quite in the other direction. It really was ascending, this, this awareness of the Stalinist past and the possibilities that we might have had. Uh, very few of us thought in the 90s that we could be where we are today um, in, in terms of the, the national memory of Stalinism. And no one who was studying Memorial at the time, nor those who worked in Memorial, could have anticipated that it would, it would be under such siege. So maybe we are uh, many years too early, but the, um, there is a very significant culture of repression here. And so uh, it is uh, even if, um, if the repressor, uh, well, the big repressor, the dictatorship is gone, there's a still repressive culture and it's, in, it's entrenched. So I can't, I can't actually answer this very good question. Thank you.
I have a follow-up question on this question. You are a Russian Soviet expert, but uh, expert, but still, uh, um, I would like to know if if you compare uh, the. The, the, uh, the approach of Vergangenheitsbewältigung or Nicht-Vergangenheitsbewältigung in Russia to, the, to what is happening in China today with the Xi, uh, Xi Jinping regime. Yeah? Don't you see many parallels in, in how, how they do it in, in Beijing and how they do it in Moscow and how they try to, to, uh, 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 to lie about, their, about the past? Thank you. Uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, I spoke earlier this year at a conference on the Maoist legacy uh, on transitional justice under state socialism. How far can you go in consideration of, of this uh, state socialism? How far can you go in, in confronting the past? So the, uh, there's been very much of a parallel. For example, really, uh, it's not true that Russia had no transitional justice mechanism whatsoever. It's had already since the 50s uh, the mechanism of rehabilitation. Essentially, you exonerate victims. They, they were not guilty of that which they had been accused of. But it doesn't really say anything else about who or what the perpetrators were, who the perpetrators were, and, or, or that the system was responsible for that. So there are ways of, 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 of let's say, letting victims know that they can eventually come back into society without, without attacking the system itself that had incarcerated them. And so China is, with, especially with the cult of Mao, uh, and, and, and finding very limited ways, very small measures to, to correct some, some individual uh, cases. So that's a very good parallel. Um, and I, I also remembered we were talking about which systems uh, have worked, and I forgot to say that. South Africa, I mean, the jury is still, is still out on where we'll be a little further down the line because we're only 20 years further. But the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission offered some very important possibilities because it was a kind of a group project to create a shared narrative, in a certain sense, to create a shared custody of the past. And, and bringing together uh, the perpetrator stories, the victim stories, looking for areas of agreement, looking for areas of disagreement, looking for areas of negotiation. So South Africa is what I would say for now a, a kind of a success, and uh, China is not. It's right up in the league with, with Russia. <laughs> Is there a discussion about the economic cost of uh, emphasizing military power and a single victory over Germany? Is there not a realization that maybe Germany has won the Second World War because they drew the right conclusions that uh, militarization of a society leads to economic disaster? And maybe if Russia will further fall behind economically, it will also realize that the focus on military might uh, also is a cause for the backwardness of the country. A very interesting perspective. Uh, I think that there would never be any sense uh, among uh, Russians, certainly not of the government, that there is any backwardness to the country. I think that, that, that there is a very deep sense that what Stalinism accomplished was getting away from that backwardness. We went from being a country of plows to being a country of tanks and, and the, uh, the, the eradication of illiteracy and winning the Second World War. No, there are only, at, at the moment, there are only positive lessons that can be learned from the Great Patriotic War and the victory in the Great Patriotic War. There's a, there's a, this victory has become a sort of a religion at this point. Uh, it is a, uh, um, one of the, some of the undisputed facts, but it's also stripped, as I said, of, of numerous gray zones. It doesn't talk about, uh, uh, a lot of things that were going on within the Soviet Union itself doesn't talk about Stalin's decimation of, 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 of the generals and, and, and the gulag, uh, uh, what was happening in the gulag during the war. So uh, 
there could be a very, a very uh, um, deep analysis of what happened during the war, what actually happened to the country, but I don't see that happening, period. I don't see that happening. Not, not there, anyway. Um, good evening. Um, I was born, I'm a foreign journalist based in Austria, and I was born in the former Yugoslavia, so we actually published almost in real time, you know, like Archipelago Gulag and uh, Solzhenitsyn and also Varlam Shalamov, who is, uh, I think, maybe even better in his uh, uh, s simple describing of the scope of the, of the crime that happened in, in Gulags. So on one side, that is uh, two points I, I would like to, to mention. Uh, the first thing is probably even I see that uh, I see that the people who are now trying uh, to make top down to have the top down strategy, you know, to erect monuments, to uh, how to say, to put it in the books, or uh, to have uh, legislature and um, uh, simply to how to say to um, clean these uh, things in, uh, or clear the, uh, uh, that uh, that decades in the history. Actually, I I, uh, I see or my impression is that uh, they still don't, do not have the critical mass because even the people like Solzhenitsyn who who erected the, the monument for Gulag, you know, uh, even he, uh, I think he, he came back to Russia to, to die there and he was not, uh, how to say, um, against the policy of great Russia, so to say, and uh, the, okay. And uh, another thing is, um, is actually the question, you know, when we talk from top-down strategy and down-up. You, you mentioned and you showed us uh, that many people were uh, or are uh, uh, rehabilitated after the... the is it possible uh, maybe to, um, to continue in that way now that uh, those people or children who were actually neglected or they could not go to school because they were sons or daughters of the enemy of the state or so, okay? So... Um, wouldn't it be possible maybe uh, with that strategy to achieve maybe more uh, so that they, um, uh, they get uh, some kind of compensation or, um, or that, um, uh, how to say, to implement new legislation or whatever that brings in ultima ratio uh, to the same result? Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, very good points. First of all, the, uh, just to say this about rehabilitation, it, it was legislation, it is ongoing, people can still apply uh, for rehabilitation. The benefits are really, really very uh, paltry, very slim. Uh, there's just a, a very little bit of money that people can get. Uh, sometimes they can get subsidized burial, but it's also difficult to, uh, to ask for. Uh, the process is complicated. The, the the um, I think it's it's there are some issues with it being directed to regions so so it's quite a bureaucratic process. Memorial and some other organizations have help for former victims. The problem is it's not quite enough just to get this this document this rehabilitation document if at the same time the state is uh, is let's say promoting other efforts that that would marginalize uh, the the personal losses, by lowering the numbers, by glorifying Stalin. There are a lot of sort of, let's say, insults that get hurled at former victims on a regular basis. Now Solzhenitsyn, um, the, first of all, the fact that Gulag Archipelago uh, uh, was even available in Russia is very, very significant. I mean, it, it, it used to be illegal to possess such a manuscript. But uh, as starting in 1990, 1991, it was, it was circulated freely in Russia, and that's a very important thing. In 2010, Putin drove the effort to get it into classrooms, but it didn't get into history classes. It got into literature classes. So it was a rather Potemkin-like, uh, uh, um, uh, let's say, move on Putin's part. And I agree with you completely about uh, Shalomov, also some, some very important uh, uh, literature. And many, many other memoirists have also gotten the victim stories uh, into 
the public space if they want to read it. Uh, Simeon Vilensky it was a memoir publisher. So he, he collected uh, thousands of manuscripts and, and published many. So there are lots of lesser known memoirs. Those who want to read these memoirs do, but it's still a very small group who does that. Um, still, I mean, better rehabilitation than no rehabilitation, but it's a, it's a very, very safe measure for the state and very, um, I don't want to say it's not significant for former victims, because in, in the 50s, this, this rehabilitation certi certificate was a sacred document. It was, it was a way to, to, to regain social status, uh, especially if there were party members and party rehabilitation. But uh, it's, it just stops at that. <laughs> So thank you, Nancy, very much for this very inspiring uh, lecture. Uh, uh, I ask myself uh, why the re stalinization is uh, so success successful, and this more important question is why it's so attractive for a nation. And I think this is a unique story, uh, because usually in Central Europe we, we are fully uh, fallen in love in victim position. So all nations are, are happy to be victims of, uh, of the past. So could you please uh, explain us to why even this Russian society wants to be, not the perpetrator of course, but yeah, Stalin, re-Stalinization of, uh, of uh, national imagination or social imagination of past means that you are not just a hero, but you are also on the, on the side of the perpetrators. Uh, Eva, yeah, very complex question. Um, you're only on the side of the perpetrators if you agree with the narrative that Stalin was a perpetrator. If 40% say, say he did more good than bad, but and... They still did these, these bad. Pardon? But they, uh, that he still did, did these bad things as well. He did bad things as well, but the, the narrative let's say, the textbook narrative and the state-sponsored narrative is he did bad things, but he did them for good reasons. And, and, we, and, we, and we came out in a better place. So that's, so, I mean, I, I, don't, say it's a, I don't say it's rational. I'm just trying to explain uh, how, how we got to where we are. And none of us predicted this, none of us. I, I, none of my uh, colleague at the time, Sovietologist, saw this coming. And when I wrote that article in 2005, I, w I was sure that I couldn't write an even more intense uh, uh, essay about this now. Um, so, so there is, uh, t to join the side of the perpetrator, well, then I have to get back to the fact that had there been a rigorous process of confronting the past, the kind of the Vergangenheitsbewältigung that would be Nuremberg or some other shape, some other model, maybe a combination of models, it wouldn't have been so easy. But since there wasn't, it's quite easy for those sentiments to arise again because there was never the, the real condemnation and the condemnation that there was never obviously didn't take root. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a really, really interesting talk. Uh, I learned, I learned so much. I have um, a question. I think it was two, one or two years ago, in the Baltic countries in Latvia, there was this um, action from the state to open the NKVD bags, like to to get the public to know about former informants. And first, it was a, a big thing, and everybody talked about it. And obviously, Latvia is a country where Stalinist past is definitely not glorified in any sense. And then the op the, it, these bags were opened, and then actually the reaction wasn't really like the public wasn't really interested. And um, suddenly, people did not apply and check whether their neighbors or their parents or whoever was actually involved. And it's partly probably also because maybe everybody was involved. So it's not only a victim society, but also a perpetrator society, however forced that was. So how much is that something that you encountered in, in Russia? Yeah, <clears throat> it's a very important point. I mean, these systems, of course, were uh, designed to implicate as many as possible. So even people who, who were in the gulag could have been working on easier jobs that were more survivable so that they could stay inside 
Uh, and, and that came with a very heavy moral legacy for them because they knew that they had victimized others uh, for their own survival. So you come across it actually quite a bit. Um, I, I have not studied perpetrators. I've studied victims, and I have found this in victims' narratives, a, 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 a sort of a, a guilt about that, but it's also these were systems designed to create a gray zone of culpability. But isn't the same in, 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 in like, it's very similar to the, the German uh, uh, story in a way that uh, basically in, in Germany, I think the bystander becomes the hero because he's not, and, and nobody wants to be a perpetrator, nobody wants to be a victim. So the bystander is the, the one we, we didn't know anything, and uh, so on. and and in, in, in Russia, um, yeah. What Eva says is the follow-up question that that kind of, uh, um, um, in a way, after after 1989, I mean, the feeling is to also to be humiliated. I mean, we lost it. Uh, we lost uh, the, the Eastern Europe. Uh, the NATO is coming to our border, and what what reflection, what what kind of reaction had it in the in the Russian society? I mean, when you learned uh, that we are a great uh, nation, and the reaction was uh, that uh, exactly what Putin plays on. No, I mean, I mean we are we, we won the war. We did a lot of uh, um, 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 uh, we, we gave uh, we sacrificed a lot, and this works. I mean, this is in 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 Germany. You have a very different approach. I would say that you, um, yeah, we lost the war. And um, yeah, I don't know the differences now, differences and similarities, I would say. I, I can only just say, you're right. I mean, there is, there, because, because of the victory in the war, it created a much different sense. Yes, uh, yes, yes, Eastern Europe was lost, but they, they still had very powerful Russia, the, actually the successor of the Soviet Union. And, and there has been a great effort to create national unity within Russia. So, so, for example, November 7th, which had been the day of the Bolshevik Revolution and a long a holiday there, uh, they couldn't really keep celebrating the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. So, so Yeltsin <clears throat> tried to turn it into a day of reconciliation, unity and reconciliation, but no one knew with what they were supposed to be reconciling. So that didn't work either. So then Putin changed it into the day of national unity because it symbolized... Something around November 7th, uh, the victory against Polish invaders in 1612. It was, it was a good neutral topic. It kept Russia strong, uh, and, and, and uh, so the fatherland uh, was victorious in that. Um, you know, it's, it's reconceptualizing the narrative to come out in a, in a positive way. Since we already mentioned Spain and, and China, I might just throw in one more country because I think that's a very striking case, and that's um, Taiwan. Because Taiwan, I think, is a, a very, very interesting case because within a couple of decades, they completely transformed themselves without any outside influence, no revolution from the outside, no foreign intervention from a dictatorship into uh, the most open society uh, in Asia. And um, they've even put up memorials now for, for the so-called white terror. Um, uh, they, they stopped basically the Chiang Kai-shek uh, memorialization. I mean, still the mausoleum is there. But, and that under the most strange circumstances because there's still this ongoing conflict with the People's Republic. So you could say actually, you know, it might even be beneficial to still have this sort of history politics where you um, sort of glorify your own past and your role in this ideological and, and very real conflict. So I think that is a very, very interesting um, case that is hardly ever mentioned, and I think a much better case than Germany, which, as you rightly mentioned, you know, it was just defeated and, and you know, forced to come to terms. Well, that's always said, it came to terms to oneself, but that took decades and was forced and occupied. And I think Taiwan, I know it's a, it might seem very exotic, but it's an interesting case, I think. Very interesting, very unconventional case that I've never seen raised in this context, but yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Okay, before we end up in Antarctic, no, okay, Susanne. <laughs> just to mention another um, strange case, you know, what just, uh, just came up to my mind when uh, I heard you talking is maybe this is the future of the past, not only in, uh, in Russia, but I recently was in Albania, 
And uh, there, you know, you have lots in every uh, larger city. You have an, uh, a museum uh, which also talks about the past of uh, uh, the Hotcha period. And at the same time, at the, uh, at the birthplace of Hotcha, you have, uh, you know, a great plaque on his birthplace. And you can buy souvenirs with uh, Hotcha's photos. So I think maybe this is the way you know, how people deal with this, uh, you know, to glorify certain parts uh, of the past uh, while at the, uh, take certain pieces out of this. As you said, you know, the, in, uh, in Albania it's the same. You can uh, talk to victims uh, who can tell you, you know, I, I was, uh, uh, did forced labor on this street and on that building and on this, this bridge. And, you know, they, uh, they are um, not imprisoned anymore, but, you know, they are uh, living a very poor life and not uh, actually, you know, honored or recognized as victims. Uh, but, you know, officially, uh, you know, there are these museums and... Uh, the state can say, okay, we, uh, we are dealing with our past. So this is uh, maybe the way how, uh, how states are going to fashion this uh, dealing with the past. Yeah. Uh, very briefly, but, uh, Albania is an excellent parallel, actually. They even have a memorial-type organization, uh, and they are having sort of a, a heck of a time getting victim stories really into the public space, but they're persevering. They're young, they're persevering. Uh, they've, uh, they've produced a documentary, I think this year or last year, called People Define the Times, with interviews with former political prisoners, uh, also lamenting uh, uh, their lack of state support for this initiative. But Albania, we should be watching Albania. We should be watching Albania, hopefully for, for better lessons than we get from watching Russia, but um, yeah, there is a there is a dual process going on. And again, when when the bright future never arrives, having a bright past is 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 a really uh, comforting way of looking at it. Okay, with this optimistic outlook on Albania, <laughs> I stop the discussion. Uh, danke schön fürs Kommen. Danke schön für den Vortrag. Uh, ich möchte Sie erinnern, dass draußen eine Fülle von Ankündigungen unserer kommenden Veranstaltungen sind, wo wir Sie gerne sehen. Einige sind im Haus, Sie sind dort gerne willkommen. Und die nächste Simon Wiesenthal Lecture ist am 12. Dezember wieder hier. Wir freuen uns ganz besonders, nach langen, langjährigen Bemühungen Enzo Traverso begrüßen zu können, der über Primo Levi sprechen wird. Am 12. Dezember sind Sie ganz herzlich wieder hier willkommen. Dankeschön fürs Kommen. Schönen Abend. Applaus